Paul, last Sunday in your message, you shared about a season in your life where fear gripped your heart related to the call that God extended to victory or gave to victory to plan a campus, to have victory in another location, uh, one church in a different location. And uh, you shared that uh, in that season, uh, when fear gripped your heart, that uh, you read a book uh, and uh, it was through that book that God spoke to you and challenged you, if I remember your words right, to get off the couch, take courage, and to step into that vision that he'd given you. I know you're in a season in your life right now uh, where that challenge, that fear challenge is present, and would love for you to share with, with me and with the Victory family about that uh, this morning. Sure. Um, as many of you know, this last year I had to take a medical leave because I have had some issues neurologically uh, that have been troubling me for some time. And uh, the reality is it's probably come about because of having concussions uh, over the years and now having some of the ramifications of that show up in my life. Well, as I took that medical leave and I've worked with doctors, it was with the goal to be able to get me back to a place where I would be able to fully engage once again in ministry and in the work. Well, I've been back about six months and have noticed that some of the very same things that have plagued me in the past have been plaguing me once again and making what I do uh, rather complicated for me. And I know on Sundays when you see me, I seem like I'm normal, whatever normal is, but I seem normal to you. But when Sunday is done, usually coming in, or actually uh, every week, Monday and Tuesday particularly, I struggle with a memory deficit. I struggle with the ability to be very focused and to concentrate. And that makes it, I think, a, a little complicated for everyone around me, though nobody has complained, and everyone, honestly, on our staff has pitched right in and have been so helpful in many ways uh, to me and for me. And so as I've navigated that and I've worked with my doctors and, and continue to pursue a wellness, there is a realization for me to continue on in this role is not going to be a possibility. And those are difficult words to say because I've been a part of this church over 32 years and have served in ministry and have loved being a part of this family and the mission of what God has been able to accomplish here and will continue to accomplish in the days ahead. But again, talking with the doctors and realizing that I've come to a place that I need to make a change. And this is my choice. The board, the staff, again, they have been so fantastic with me and they have been so supportive and they have accommodated me in a number of ways. But I realize that in my own unhealthiness, that keeps me from being a really healthy leader. And as a church, as a movement to this region, I believe that victory deserves very much to have a healthy leader that is moving it forward, accomplishing the mission that God has placed on the heart of us as leaders, as a church for that matter. And so as I step aside, it is with this idea that um, God has something more in the future for what this church will do. And the leaders and the staff will continue to pray and discern what God will do here in the coming days as they do search for a new leader. But I want you to know that I have loved being a part of all of this. And uh, my wife and I are going to continue to attend Victory. I'll continue to work with my doctors and pursue this wellness. And we're going to attend because you are our family. We're going to worship here and be a part of the congregation, celebrating what God is doing, cheering the staff as well as the elders on. But I will again. I'll be making some changes in my own life so I, I can uh, have that wellness, I can have that healthiness, and that I can have, um, well, a good future for what God has in store for me. Well, Paul, first, thank you for the leadership you've provided Victory Highway over these last 32 years and the various roles that you've held. And thank you for the leadership that, you sh that you've shown, even in this decision that you've made. Uh, it's been uh, obviously a very difficult season and challenge for you physically. Uh, and I just appreciate the way you've handled yourself, your humility, and uh, your perspective on wanting to do the very best uh, for victory. And to you as a Victory Church family, uh, I just want to encourage you and remind you that uh, over these next several weeks and months, that the pastoral staff of the church and the church elders, your church board, will be providing uh, the necessary leadership, guiding the church forward. It's my privilege to work in support of them as 
particularly the church elders, begin to think about next steps. And you'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. But for now, I just want to uh, commend the church board, commend the church staff. Uh, you're, you're in great care. Uh, but for today, uh, Pastor Paul, again, I want to thank you. Uh, and uh, I want you to know you have my prayers. You. you undoubtedly have the prayers of your church family, and you have the prayers of your district family as you navigate this season in your life. And Victory, you have the, my prayers and the prayers of your district family as we together navigate the next steps uh, for the future of Victory Highway. Thank you. I knew this day would come, not so soon. I mean, 32 years, I feel like I just started. Um, but I knew the moment. Unfortunately, the timing is not what I uh, wish it to be, but be that as it may. Did not desire to be impersonal by doing it on the screen, showing the video. Uh, the wisdom from the staff and the board was, you probably want to try and say it on video because if I stand before you and say what you just heard, I would just ugly cry. And you don't want to see me ugly cry. I uh, came this morning and uh, I told myself, you're not going to cry, you're not going to cry, you're not going to cry, because I've been crying a great deal. And uh, I get out of the car, start walking across the parking lot, and I see Pastor Aaron, and I started to cry. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. I know it doesn't. Um, I, just a moment here, and, and you'll put... I have loved working with him. I have. He has the gift of teaching in an extraordinary way that is, I have, I've encountered, and I'm not exaggerating, there's no flattery to this, um, I've encountered few who have had it quite the way I have seen it played out in Aaron's life and love him deeply and so proud of how God has used him and uh, will continue to use him as well as the staff. Um, he really is a, a good man. I hope you know I love you. I, I don't say those words lightly. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, Paul talks about his love for those churches in a, in a fatherly way, and, and I hope you don't misunderstand that, um, but in a fatherly way, in a very deep way, I understand why he loved the group of people that he was entrusted with, and I feel the same. I am so grateful. Oh, my goodness. Um, I am so grateful that I've done life with a bunch of history makers if you read the book of Romans in chapter 16, as Paul's wrapping up his letter, he just starts naming all these people. And I'd love to do a sermon on it because it's a, all the things that he does is incredible. But as he names all these people, he's talking about these history makers that because of their faithfulness to the gospel and the pursuit of the Jesus way of life, because of them, because of Paul, we're here today. We're here today because they took very seriously being kingdom builders and culture changers. And wow, what a ride. I don't know if you've seen the movie Hook. It came out in the 90s. Some of you are too young for it. Maybe your parents will get it on so you can watch it. It starred Robin Williams, Dustin Hoffman, and Julia Roberts. Robin Williams plays Peter Pan, but he grows up and he forgets that he's Peter Pan. Well, he finds himself back in Neverland, and he doesn't discover for a little while that he actually is the Pan Man. And so, through a series of events, he realizes that even though he's grown up, he's Peter Pan. And he once again has to take on this epic battle between good and evil, between Peter Pan and the Lost Boys and Captain Hook and his pirates. And it's a great movie. I really enjoy it. And uh, when Peter Pan defeated Hook once again, at the end of the movie, uh, Peter decides he has to go back to London and live out his life as a father and as a husband, as a lawyer, and, and that he needed to leave Neverland. And at the end of the movie, Peter's gone, and this little boy 
I love this scene. You got to go home. Just, you can Google it. It's just a great scene. This little boy comes out and he says, now that was a great adventure. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a great adventure. From the really tough stuff to the really good stuff and everything in between. This has been a great adventure for me. And I believe for us. But I need you to hear me. This adventure doesn't stop because I'm transitioning to a different season of my own life. I have been here only as a servant to walk alongside you and together be kingdom builders. This isn't Paul's church. You know that. I have not tried to build a monument to myself. That would be wrong. I've endeavored to work with a great group of people and a wonderful group of elders to help us fulfill the mission that Jesus put before us in Matthew 28, 19, that we are to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing those who cross the line of faith and then teaching them the word of God to live by it so their lives will be changed. We have endeavored to do that for a very long time, and we've seen God do a wonderful thing. When I came here in 1989, I was 10 years old, and <laughs> there were two pastors on staff. Vaughn was volunteering as our worship leader, but that was our crew. Now look what happened, what God has done over the years, and how that adventure has continued. I was going to do a little talk, and I have a few words for you that will be brief. And I know brief isn't necessarily the word most people use around me, but I was thinking of the book of Acts, probably one of my favorite books in the New Testament. They are all probably my favorite books. I always say that. Acts is so amazing because after the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of the historical event of Jesus coming from the grave, and authenticating exactly who he claims himself to be, the Son of God, the Savior of humanity. This movement is launched, the ecclesia, the church. Jesus had said before the crucifixion, I'm going to build my church, and not even hell itself will stop it. Well, once the resurrection had come about, this movement called the church goes forward, and we get this book called the Book of Acts. Now, some people say it's the acts of the Holy Spirit and what he did in those early days. Others would say, no, it's the acts of the apostles and how God used them. I think it's both. It's how the Holy Spirit partnered with the earliest followers to be a part of a movement. One author said the book of Acts should be titled this, The Miracle of Changed Lives. I love that. The whole book is a miracle of changed lives. Men and women who were changed, who decided to partner with the Spirit to help change a world. That's the book of Acts. Now, there are 28 chapters there. And if you get to the 28th chapter, and if you've never read the book of Acts, that's your homework for the week. Get to, get, get to Acts 28, and it almost ends abruptly. And it's like, well, that's not how you end a story. Because the story isn't finished. There is an Acts 29. It's not in the Bible. You and I are Acts 29. We're the story that is still being written. God is still in the business, just like he was in those earliest days, at seeking lost people and redeeming broken lives. God is still in the business of inviting messy people, really messy people like me, into a relationship with him. And in that relationship, in all my messiness, to work with me, with his spirit inside of me, and with his truth before me, to help me become fully alive in him, a redeemed person. He's still doing that all over the place. He's doing it in China today, and in Iraq, and Iran, and Russia, and California. All over the place. Because he's going to build his church. 
and he's going to write the story. And Acts 29 is, is still happening, and there are a lot of people who have gone before us who have been a part of the story. And there are going to be some who write the story after us. But listen to me. Today is your day. Today you are a part of the story for a time such as this. God is not done writing. Yes, I'm moving to a different season. But I trust the staff and I trust the elders. They have your best interest at heart. You need to hear that. They have your best interest at heart. And they have a singular focus to a mission. And I would dare say that sitting right at the top of their list in their decision-making process is this one prime directive. We will do what honors God and is in the best interest of victory. That's what they endeavor to do. I'm not saying that lightly. You may disagree with them. Pray for them. They're not trying to hurt you. They want you to experience God's best in every way. I want to encourage you, if not admonish you, to remember what Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 13, that we are to honor our leaders. We are to respect them. He's not talking about leaders having a lordship over you, but they've been entrusted with a great responsibility that has eternal consequences, and they so much want God's best in your life. That's why, even though this is extremely difficult for me, and I'm going through the grieving stages as if I was at a funeral of someone that I deeply love. I said recently, I don't know, even with my own family members, who I love. I don't know if I have felt this kind of grief even there because of how I feel about you. But I have all the confidence that God's story, what he did in the first century, he's still doing now. And will continue to do it into the future. Because he's going to build his church. Here's the question. Actually, there are two of them. Do you want to be a part of the story? I think that's a really important question. Do you want to be a part of the story? Secondly, what part of the story do you want to write? Maybe I'll put it this way. When the book is open, the story is read, what will be written of you? Will it be written of you that you spent your life building your bank account, getting a better title in your job or more letters after your name because of degrees? Will the summation of your life be that you it toured the world or you had a beautiful home or you had all this money? Is that really what you're going to let the sum of your life be? Or will you embrace a greater adventure? And by the way, none of that stuff is wrong. I I'm not suggesting otherwise. But that's little kingdom stuff that all goes away. The thing that matters is the kingdom of the Father. And so will you be a part of the story? And what part of the story will you write? Because God uses ordinary people. He doesn't just use the Paul and the Peters and the James and the John. He doesn't use Charles Spurgeon and Billy Graham and John Wesley and all these great people of faith through history. He uses people, ordinary people, like you, like me, to be kingdom builders and culture changers. That's why the adventure doesn't stop. There is so much more in store for the very next chapter of this church. I know it's uncertain. It's uncertain for me. But that's why the Lord said to Joshua three times, Joshua, military genius, when he was going to take the Israelites across the Jordan into the promised land, three times he said this, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Joshua, I know it's before you. I know you don't, but I know it's before you. I want you to be strong and courageous because I'm going to be with you in this journey. God is with you. He's in control, and you can trust him. God is with you. 
He's in control. And you can trust him. And here's the beauty. When your story is done, and your story will be done, the greatest, the greatest phrase that you could ever hear is the phrase, well done, good and faithful. Earlier I said there might even be a better phrase, and I think there is. Welcome, my daughter and my son. I love you not because you serve me. I love you because you have amazing value. And you are invited into a kingdom endeavor that's an adventure. And I love that you are my daughter and that you are my son. And I get to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. So please, I'm going to ask you in these days, pray for your leaders. Number two, engage yourself in ministry around here. Roll up your sleeves, pick up your towel, as Jesus taught us in John chapter 13, that we are to serve one another. Pick up your towel. Don't wait for somebody else to serve. Don't say, well, I'm 85 years old and I've done my duty. No, 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 no. There's no retirement anywhere in the scripture. Nothing whatsoever speaks of it. Pick up your towel, serve. This body needs you to be a part of it. And when your feelings get hurt and your feelings will get hurt, show grace. Keep short accounts. Go to somebody and see to make it right. But stay engaged in the kingdom endeavors. If you will, this movement won't stop. It'll move. But here's my caution. There is an evil one. Jesus talked about him very clearly. And he will set himself against the work of God. He does not have to have the victory. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But if we're going to win, it's not by sitting on the sidelines. It's by engaging ourselves into kingdom endeavors, honoring the Father, surrendering our life to Jesus, letting the Spirit work in us, and doing it together. So I hope one day you'll stand in front of a camera and you'll say, now that was a great adventure. Let me pray for you. Father, I'm so grateful for the people that I've been able to do life with and genuinely do love them. These are your people and you care so much for them. You care for them that they would grow and find freedom from bondage and brokenness, from shame, from guilt, from this sense of condemnation, you have come to bring us alive. You invite us into a place of knowing what it is to be loved and changed. I pray that everyone in here will see Christ formed in them, as Paul writes. Please, do this for their sake. Let the kingdom come. Let your will be done in all of us. And I pray that all these people who have given their life to Christ over the years, that we will see double that in the days to come. That all these people who have changed the trajectory of their life to pursue the Jesus way of life, that we will see triple that. I pray that this place continues to see the vibrancy of the Holy Spirit move. And most of all, most of all, that we would just decide that we will love one another. Please, help us be people who don't just say those words, but live that out to the very core of our being. I pray this for this congregation, and I bless them in your name and pray your favor over them. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not as ignorant or as arrogant to think I can add anything to that. And <clears throat> I don't think you'd remember anything I said <laughs> anyway. Except for perhaps that just seeing my face makes people cry. That's it's not the first time I've heard that. 
What I do want to do is read a little bit of scripture over you for a moment. It's Paul <laughs> writing Church of Philippi, and this is what he says. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united to Christ, if there is any comfort in his love, if there is any common sharing of the Spirit, if there is any tenderness or compassion within you, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, one of mind. Paul says that, that as the leader of the church, his joy is made complete by the people coming together in community. That we find this comfort and this encouragement in our oneness as we come together. And he says out of that kind of flows this, and, and the word that he's using is, is in your guts, right in, the, right in the bowels is where the seat of emotion is for the Hebrews. It's where these sort of intense feelings come from, the anger, love, grief. And he says the, the way we do this is by coming together. And then he tells the church in Corinth, he says, the, the way that, that we know that, that we're one, the way that we know is we bear one another's burdens. Grief, sadness, these are powerful things. And we weren't created to go through them by ourselves. If you try, it's going to be a very similar experience to try to pogo stick through the snow. You see, one little point can't handle. If you want to walk through the snow, you've got to have snowshoes where the, the pressure is spread out. And the burden is not on one place, but through us all. See, when one of us grieves, we all grieve. When one of us is hurt, we all hurt. And one of us has a burden. We come together and we carry it. That is the community and the fellowship of the faith. And so we're going to do that today, together. Here in a moment, we're going to have Pastor Paul and Chris come forward, and we're going to pray over them as a church who loves them, and, and you are deeply loved. <laughs> By a church who cares for them, that church that wants to bear their burdens together. Now, if you're new here, this is your first time, part of me wants to say, it's, it's not always like this. <laughs> but there's this other piece of me wants to say, no, 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 it is exactly like this. Because there is nothing more a part of the DNA of victory than coming around someone we love and lifting them up to Christ when they can't do it on their own. There is nothing more Christ-like then coming together, as, as he says, with one mouth, proclaiming the mission, with one mind, believing the truth, with one mission of moving forward the kingdom of God in love and in compassion and in tenderness, bearing the burdens of one another when it is impossible to do it alone. So I'm going to ask that everyone would stand with us here today. If you're in Elmira and our Elmira campus has been watching all of this, Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Since you can't come here in the moment, I'm going to ask that you put your hands out. If you're in Elmira, I'm going to ask you to put your hands out towards Pastor Paul on the screen. I'm going to ask Paul and Chris would come forward here in the center. And there will be a time later for celebration. We're going to celebrate what God has done, what God is doing, and what I know God is going to continue to do. That day will come. But for now, we're going to bear burdens together. We're going to carry our brother and sister to Christ. So I'm going to ask if Pastor Vaughn would come and lead us in a congregational prayer together. I want to invite you to feel free as we do a victory circle time. If you want to come over and lay hands on Paul and Chris and pray for them, I want to invite you to come right now if you want to do that.
For those of you who remain in your seats, if you would extend your right hand as we pray a blessing upon them. Father, we come to you at this moment. We're just a mixed bag of emotions. Our hearts are heavy, partially for Pastor Paul and his family, and partially, probably even selfishly, for ourselves, our community, and this church. God, we're saddened by the medical issues that Paul has faced for these many months. And also for Chris, as she has experienced this with him, with him firsthand, side by side, to be his encourager and support. To some extent, our hearts grieve with them that 32 years of fruitful ministry has culminated in this fashion. We sense the loss that will exist because our church and community will no longer have the privileges of his leadership and, and influence upon our lives as together we have endeavored to make this region a better place to live. God, we're hurting. But at the same time, in the midst of our hurt, our hearts are grateful for who you are and the goodness that you've demonstrated towards us. That we've had the privilege of doing life with Paul and Chris for these many years. Lord, that's such a rare privilege, privilege that most churches never get to experience. We've benefited from Paul's vision, his passion and his faithfulness to the teaching of your word and that without compromise. He has challenged us, inspired us, and helped equip us to walk in this Jesus way of life. He has been relentless in challenging us to do things with excellence, for excellence honors God and inspires people. Paul has been the glue that has held us together through several pastoral changes and has done so with humility and steadfastness making sure that we stayed the course of proclaiming the life-changing power of Jesus Christ and making fully devoted followers of him. He's reminded us time and again, as he just mentioned a few moments ago, that this is not his church. We are not a church that is based upon a personality, but rather upon the five purposes of worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. God, this is your church. We are so grateful that Paul has been forward-thinking and proactive in helping us to be a church that endeavors to reach each generation and to have influence in building God's kingdom around the world. We thank you for his vision and commitment to victory, not be merely being a big church, but being the church with a big heart. He has championed our efforts to be a body of believers that invest in and serve our communities. Lord, we're grateful that when the going got tough, when offers came from other churches, that he persevered and stayed true to your calling upon his life to serve here at Victory. He has fought the good fight, and he has finished this leg of his race, and he has done so with integrity, compassion, and conviction. And so now together as the Victory family, we now ask that your favor would rest upon him and Chris. We ask that you continue to bring healing to his brain and his entire being. Give him rest, Father. May he know the presence and the power of God in their lives in ever-increasing ways. And may you continue to use them to build your kingdom in ways that they could never have even imagined. And now, Paul and Chris, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May God lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And with gratitude, hope, and expectancy, all of God's people said, amen. amen.